the Red Cross stands high in their admiration. Its readiness to meet the needs of the well and help minister to the wounded. Even more important, the devotion and warm-hearted sympathy of the Red Cross girl. The Red Cross is often seen to be the friendly hand of this nation reaching across the sea to sustain its fighting men. The battlefront and the home front, together we have found the victory. This video marks my first entry into the World War II Sewing Challenge, hosted in part by Melissa of Sew Biased. And when she shared this booklet of Canadian wartime knitting patterns, I decided that my first entry into this challenge would come in the form of a knitted good, specifically a v-necked vest. Not only because I love v-necks and have a limited amount of yarn, but also because I want it in on whatever bit of juicy gossip these two were clearly privy to. And, as one does when a knitting project is afoot, I packed up my needles and my instructions and headed off to a cabin in the Swedish woods to get some work done, and I invite you to join me as we work our way through this pattern and learn a bit more about the wartime knitting effort from a primarily North American perspective. I'm starting with the back first, so any slappiness in the learning curve of this pattern will be less visible. I'm a decent knitter and comfortable with the basic knit and purl stitches, and I've done some cabling patterns, but I've never made much beyond a classic scarf, and I definitely haven't knit anything yet this season, so I was pleased to see the pattern started with a couple inches of simple one by one ribbing so I could ease my hands back into the actions. Canada joined the Second World War in September of 1939, but wartime knitting was not a new concept. American women on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line knit socks for Civil War soldiers, and during World War I, families in rural Canada were given knitting machines and 10 pounds of wool to knit for the war effort, and millions of knitted items were created by citizens and shipped to forces on the front lines. When the war to end all wars was done, many of these knitters either put their needles away or turned to more colorful personal projects, renouncing gray and khaki yarn for good or so they thought. And so, in 1939, as war was declared and troops were sent overseas, women's institutions, church committees, and countless other social organizations once again hosted knitting bees, knitting teas, and knitting showers. Those who didn't knit raised funds to supply wool and needles for knitters, or helped ship comfort packages, including knitted garments, to the troops. All knitting was collected and distributed by the Red Cross, both in Canada and the United States. In January of 1942, just months after the U.S. joined the Allied forces, the War Production Board designated the American Red Cross as the single clearing agency for all knitting and granted them priority status for receiving wool. You are listening to the Canadian Red Cross Emergency Appeal Broadcast, direct from Hollywood. This is Merle O'Brien speaking. A year has passed since the women of Canada began their great work on behalf of the fighting forces and the suffering civilian victims of war. The supplies that they have made are now pouring from the Canadian Red Cross warehouses in England, bringing comfort to thousands of innocent and helpless victims of air raids. Half a million garments are needed for British refugees and evacuees. Woolen comforts must be supplied to our soldiers, sailors and airmen, particularly during the winter months. Hospital and surgical supplies must be provided for the sick and wounded. These mounting needs offer a challenge which Canadians have never failed to meet. It is your contribution, large or small, whatever you can give to meet this urgent appeal. It is your contribution that will help to purchase materials that will be used to keep supplies moving steadily to relieve suffering, to comfort those who are bearing the brunt of the attack. With the bottom ribbing done, it was time to jump into the pattern, which was a fairly simple 15 stitch wide pattern that was repeated across the whole width of the vest. In wartime, knitting became more than a hobby. It was an act of patriotism. Knitting needles, spared from metal drives because they were so useful, were seen as the weapons of the home front. These knitted items, made almost exclusively out of wool yarn in the days before synthetic fabrics, were put to good use and became an essential part of soldiers' uniforms. 
socks, which needed to be changed frequently to prevent trench foot, were produced by the ton, alongside sweaters, vests, balaclavas, and more. After nine rows, I checked the length of my pattern compared to the ideal length listed on the instructions. And while my test swatch was pretty on gauge for the width, it ran a bit taller than I'd like, so I'm keeping track of my progress in case I need to shorten the length. As the sun set and the light dwindled, I decided to switch gears to a task that didn't require as much light, winding up my yarn in a decidedly low-tech method. And speaking of low-tech, the question of why garments should be knit by hand when they were knitting machines sometimes arose, especially early on in the war. First of all, there was the fact that donated hand knits cost the military nothing saved wear and tear on the limited knitting machines remaining, and that hand-knit socks outlasted machine-knit ones. But besides the purely practical reasons, the war years were stressful to those on the home front, and knitting was a great way to relieve the stress and for citizens to feel like they were doing their part to contribute to the war effort. As my Monarch knitting booklet put it, Hand knitting is an opportunity to express, in tangible form, care and affection for those who are dear. It is an opportunity to put idle time to profitable advantage, realizing that some airman, some soldier, or some sailor, often unknown to you, will be made happier by your work. In this time of crisis, I feel that every housewife should budget her time and her money so that she may help our national defense. Budget her time so that she may sew or knit for the Red Cross, and budget her money so that she may buy defense bonds and stamps. Like everyone else, I didn't want this war. But now that it's been thrust upon us, I pledge myself to do everything in my power to help to win it. Back in the bright light of a new day, I picked the knitting back up. And by now, I was really starting to get more comfortable with the pattern. I continue to track my height every 9 rows, consistently running about 3 millimeters or 1 eighth of an inch tall each time. The horizontal pattern repeats every 15 stitches and the vertical pattern repeats every 30 rows, so I got lots of practice with the various stitch combinations. This is Lieutenant Jack Scott with the 1st Canadian Army in Belgium. I got a letter from my mother out in Vancouver today, and she's kind of worried about something. Seems that the deadline for mailing Christmas presents to the troops over here is getting close, and she's pretty much in a fog about what kind of a gift will be suitable for a son who's in France or Belgium, or maybe in Holland. There are probably a lot of mothers and wives who are in the same boat, so I've got three fellows here at the microphone our own particular brain trust, to find out what the troops really want. From left to right, here they are. Well, I'm Corporal Bob Christie from Toronto. Mm -hmm. Corporal Jacques Monroe here. My and town's Montreal. Right. And uh, I'm Lance Corporal Walter Hall of Bowmanville, Ontario. Walter, what suggestions have you got on this? Well, there are certainly a lot of things we don't want. We don't want anything to ha we have to pack. And most clothing is pretty well excess baggage. Except socks. You can always use socks. And most of the guys would go for a sweater, one of those turtleneck kind, khaki color. By now, I was several rows into my vest and feeling much more comfortable with the pattern, so I decided to tackle some evening knitting by firelight. 
One of the reasons that this vest in particular caught my eye was that it had a very nice cable pattern. Cables are the braid-like designs in the yarn, and the patterns that make use of them are not as common in wartime patterns, in large part because they require more yarn than a garment of the same dimensions that's knit in a plain pattern, and wool was in high demand during the war years. The vast majority of wool was imported from Great Britain and Australia, and the war made it incredibly difficult to ship. Even though the Red Cross was given priority status, with so many uses for wool, it wasn't long before yarn for knitting was in short supply. In response to the shortage, some branches of the Red Cross set up programs to card and spin their own yarn from raw wool. Men and machines at war. Wool prepared for spinning and weaving. Wool for uniforms. Wool for blankets. Wool for our army, our air force, and our navy. But not all this work is done by great machines of steel. The humble wooden spinning wheel is at work once more, at work for the Navy. Volunteer workers are busy teasing and carding the greasy natural wool to make special garments to keep out cold and wet. They prepare it by hand and spin it by hand as in ages past, for only the thickest natural hand-spun wool is good enough for the job. Wool to protect the men who guard our ships. Many of these voluntary workers have husbands and sons at sea. All have found out for themselves how they can best help win this war. By now I had finished the back portion of the vest and started in on the front, which is the same as the back for the first hundred rows or so. And at this point, I was so familiar with the pattern that I found I didn't need to consult the instructions with each new row, I merely kept track of which row I was on so that I knew precisely when to start shaping the armholes. It made complete sense to me then that many wartime knitters chose to knit the same item in the same size again and again so that they could memorize the pattern and produce pieces more quickly. Through the course of the project, anytime I had a question or a doubt about the instructions, which admittedly were pretty good for their time, I mostly turned to YouTube for an answer. Like when explicitly instructed not to tie knots to join the wool and I had to look up how to splice yarn. The answer, if you're wondering, is a spit splice. But in a time without the free and widely available knowledge of the internet, what was a girl to do? Well, one option would have been to join a local stitch and bitch group. The term, which is more recently associated with a series of instructional knitting books from the early 2000s, has its origins in World War II when women would gather in groups to knit, stitch, and discuss everything from parenting to politics and news of the war. Some of us are soldiers or sailors, some of us are civilians. A few of us are decorated with medals for heroic achievement, but all of us can have that deep and permanent inner satisfaction that comes from doing the best we know how. Each of us playing an honorable part in the great struggle to save our democratic civilization. 
With the front and backs finished, I moved on to the ribbed neckline and shoulder bands. Following the order in the instructions, I started with the neckline, first picking up the stitches and then knitting them in a simple one by one ribbing pattern to match the bottom of the vest. I'm a bit of a tight knitter, so I found it was faster and easier to pick up the stitches with the help of a crochet hook. With a few rows of the ribbing done, I paused to admire the V for victory that was slowly becoming more and more pronounced. Then the shoulder seams were sewn together, including the ribbed neckband I had just knit, and the same process was repeated to give a small ribbed cuff on the armholes as well. And if you're wondering why the pattern instructs you to knit all the ribbed borders flat and then sew them together, rather than just knit them in the round as one continuous border, be sure to check out my behind the seams video where I talk more about the technical aspects of this garment and the logic behind certain design decisions I discovered with a bit of experimental archaeology. The next step was blocking my work, a process which relaxes all the stitches and evens out the tension, and is especially beneficial when doing a cabled pattern. A friend described the blocking process to me as her way of saying goodbye to a finished project, and while for me the project isn't finished until the video goes live, I love the poetry behind the sentiment and I did find the process very relaxing and enjoyable. The instructions didn't specify where in the process the blocking should happen, but it did give the measurements of the final garment when blocked, which not only told me that they definitely intended the vest to be blocked, but also which dimensions to block it to. Armed with this information, I took my measuring tape and a small army of pins and used the checkered pattern of the fabric, chosen specifically for this purpose, to keep my lines straight and square. With everything pinned in place, I set about the task of removing all the stray hairs, both mine and canals, from between my stitches. I imagine it wasn't uncommon for a soldier to receive a garment with similar small traces of its maker still wound in the literal fabric of its being, a tangible reminder of the human hand that manufactured it, and one that hopefully warmed their heart as well as their body. Besides the small, unintentional traces that might be left in a hand-knitted piece, it was also not unusual for knitters to tuck a message into the finished garment for the soldier who would receive it, to boost morale and remind him that he was in their thoughts. There were even anecdotes of young soldiers returning from the war, seeking out their knitter, and in some cases developing romantic relationships with them, but I found no concrete proof of this, so this may just be a romanticized urban legend. The next step was to join the front and the back, the only instructions being to sew seams neatly, and so I did just that. I think this may have been my favorite step of the entire process. After spending days and days knitting, it was fun and incredibly satisfying to see the immediate and tangible process of the seam zipping itself closed under my hand. Hello friends, I just wanted to pop in here before the reveal to say that if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to learn even more about the absolutely fascinating history of wartime knitting throughout the centuries, including what knitting has to do with wartime espionage, or why I blame the war for my absolutely glacial knitting style, check out my video on the history of wartime knitting linked at the end of the video. It's going to be chock full of some amazing photos and videos and all of the tidbits that I just couldn't fit into this video, so definitely go check it out. And if you'd like to see a detailed breakdown of this pattern on a more technical level, such as instruction typos, needle sizes, and number of rows used, 
or just my reflections on making this pattern as a very beginning level knitter, be sure to check out my behind the scenes video for this project, which will also be linked in the end screen once it's released. If you have any questions about the pattern, be sure to leave them below and I'll do my best to cover them in that video. And as always, if you want to support the time and effort that went into the knitting, the editing, or the hours and hours digging up relevant radio broadcasts and speeches, you can support my work over on Coffee by following the link in the description. And now, let's take a look at the final results. I hope you realize that all you have done for the soldier has been truly appreciated. Never have they felt absent from your anxious care and warm affection. On the other hand, I find large numbers of people who are looking about for some, something to do in the defense effort. They, they are excited, they have a lot of surplus energy, they are in sympathy with the government's program. It is the plain fact that the American people are united as never before in their determination to do a job and to do it well. Tonight, the Canadian Red Cross Society is appealing for $5 million to help Canadian and British men, women, and children in the hours of their greatest need. What would you three most like? What about that, Bob? Well, put me down for that turtleneck sweater. <laughs>